Meg. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Meg, and thank you to the planning committee for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I really appreciate it. I hope to learn a lot. I had mentioned to a couple of colleagues that as I prepared this talk and uh, looked at your agenda for the day, I realized I was sort of wandering around on the margins of what I know something about. Uh, and I, I looked through a lot of the journals that, uh, that sort of uh, are part of the construction and building uh, uh, professions to see what are people talking about, what are they publishing. And uh, I came away convinced that it's a pretty wild west. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so Chris has challenged us with finding a center of gravity, and I have a great appreciation for how difficult that is likely to be. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm hoping that today uh, gets us somewhere along that journey, because uh, it is a fairly mixed up, complex uh, discussion that's going on around the area of chemicals in, uh, in uh, building materials. So I want to uh, talk about uh, several topics here today. Uh, the growing variety of building materials, which you're all aware of, and then how individuals, and I'll talk about who that is in a minute, uh, can be exposed to chemicals uh, from the built environment. Uh, some of the challenges around hazard information, and I will use some examples. And obviously this is a, a, an enormous topic, so I really have to focus in on a few illustrative examples talk about some of the health-related consequences uh, throughout the product life cycle, as was mentioned, and that's going to be a general theme, to, to pay attention right from the beginning to end of life, um, with a focus entirely on chemicals, really, and I'm not going to be talking about radiation, mold, and pests, and, and some of those, uh, those topics. And then uh, something about data gaps and how we should maybe think about how we make decisions based on, on what we know and, more importantly, what we don't know. Uh, you all know better than I do uh, that we're not talking about something that's trivial here. This is a big part of the economy. Uh, lots of raw materials go into buildings. Uh, as you are well aware and has already been mentioned, uh, buildings are enormous uh, uh, consumers of, of electricity. And if you put, if you put uh, all of the electricity and other uh, sources of greenhouse gas emissions from buildings, uh, together, it's about 45% of total U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Now, you look at chemicals in construction accounts for about 2 to 3% of chemical use in the United States. That, one might argue, is not a very big percentage, although it's a, it's a, a percentage of a, of a big volume. But I think one of the challenges is going to be as you begin to think about how we begin to bring this analysis into the green building discussion, is, is to confront this whole issue is how, how does this scale in terms of priorities? Uh, and I, I think, I'm hoping that today we'll be able to talk a little bit about that. Um, there are, of course, a lot of conventional building materials that have been around for a very long time, wood, stone, cement, metals, and so on. Uh, but what we're really talking about now is the tremendous growth in synthetic building materials. And I've listed here uh, some of the things that I'll be briefly mentioning, and, and you'll recognize these categories of materials, uh, adhesive, ceilings, uh, sealants, caulks, and so on, that are, are the, really the growing dimension of building materials. Um, according to uh, industry publications, protective coatings, sealers, caulks, and adhesives are the largest segments of that list. Uh, and, and then uh, others that are not far behind are things like cement and asphalt additives. Uh, and it's really quite extraordinary to see what's going on in building in terms of what's being put into cement to, to impart certain performance characteristics uh, uh, that, are, that are new and, and being tried in various environments. Uh, and then grout and mortar and polymer flooring and sprayed foam and so on. Uh, this collectively represents about $7.7 .7 billion in sales, growing at about 3.5% annually. One of the take-home points for me has been that uh, this collection of building materials are really complex mixtures of multiple chemicals designed primarily for function and performance. And the mixtures are enormously variable. Uh, and they change all the time. 
Uh, and it's, so it's going to be very difficult for us to begin to get our, our arms around the whole idea of identifying uh, components in materials and realizing that's good, that is a shifting landscape. Uh, that is continuing to evolve as people uh, do more uh, sort of uh, clever things. And the question I uh, always ask is, it's clever, but is it wise to do that? And uh, we'll get into that sort of uh, dichotomy a little bit uh, as we go along. Many constituents that are being added in various uh, amounts to some of these new materials are known to be hazardous, but others are completely untested in terms of their safety profiles. They're being used because they impart certain performance or function characteristics, but we really don't know much at all about what their safety profile is. Uh, and, the ex and the exposures throughout the life cycle are often very poorly characterized. Now, if we think about this across the lifespan uh, uh, of the material, we do then put that up against uh, uh, who is at risk of exposure? Are we supposed to be responding to that? <laughs> the last time I was in this room, there was an earthquake. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll go ahead unless we're told not to. Um, uh, so, uh, materials and product manufacturers are clearly uh, early in the chain of possible exposures, uh, then uh, I don't want us to forget fence line communities, those communities that are near manufacturing plants that may be repeatedly and chronically exposed to emissions that come from those plants, even if the community members are not particularly associated with what's going on within the walls of the industry. Uh, there are, of course, construction workers and then building occupants uh, along the line, and then at the end of life, uh, we have concerns around the uh, uh, disposal of construction debris and recycled material where things that might have been embodied in materials to which people weren't exposed can now be exposed as, as this is being broken down, recycled, or, or thrown away. So basically we're talking about a large uh, uh, number of people in, uh, in our communities, workers, families, uh, our communities, and then wildlife and the general environment. Exposure pathways to chemicals in building materials are really quite varied from dermal exposure, uh, 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 which then can be absorbed through the skin into the systemic circulation in varying amounts depending on the, the nature of the chemical. Inhalation exposures, of course, are important for things that get volatilized or aerosolized or get attached to particulates in the air. Uh, that's another mechanism of exposure. Ingestion from hand-to-mouth activity and hand-to-mouth transfer. This is particularly important for children who are living in uh, buildings where chemicals in the indoor environment can get into the, uh, into the in interior environment and then into the dust. Uh, uh, and then children, of course, crawling around on the floor have a lot more dust ingestion than adults do in the same, in the same space. And there are a lot of studies that have been published in chemicals that you can find in dust, indoor dust. Uh, and I just listed a few of them here, but you can see it really ranges across a wide range of chemicals that uh, are identified in household dust. And then some chemicals that are in, uh, in building materials, uh, actually because they get out into the general environment, can get into the food chain and then come back to us in the food that we eat, even though it didn't, didn't, that food may have originated outside the built environment. There are a number of uh, determinants of indoor environmental quality. I've listed some here. This is important to me because what this does, uh, from my view, is point out how difficult it is to study the indoor environment. Uh, you know, are, are, are looking at volatile organic compounds, VOCs, which has been going on for quite a long time. Uh, when people began doing monitoring of the indoor environment, it became very clear that even in a room this size, if you started doing monitoring, you might get very different levels of chemicals in the air over in that corner compared to this corner. And it could change over time. 
depending on the time of day and how the heat, uh, HVAC system was working, what the temperature in the building was, would it, it would influence emissions, what was going on in terms of operations at the time that the, that the study was done. So there are a lot of variables that influence the quality of the indoor environment that make it very difficult to study it. And I think we want to keep that in mind as we begin to think about putting together a research agenda as well. These, of course, are some of the volatile organic compounds that have been uh, so instructive. You're all familiar with this problem, and, and it's been studied, as I understand it, going back into the, well, in the 1980s and 90s. A lot of work has been done on this. Uh, we're still dealing with them. The problem hasn't gone away. Some of these, some of these chemicals are still in widespread use. Uh, of course, levels of VOCs are often highest immediately after uh, manufa manufacture a building and construction of a building, uh, but they don't go away after that. Uh, there are some uh, materials that are brought into buildings that continually off-gas over a long period of time, so that this is not just simply a problem at the time of construction that then uh, disappears. And the health effects that are associated with some of these <laughs> have been really very uh, challenging to study. The concept of the sick building syndrome is a very real phenomenon. And it's been extraordinarily challenging to figure out because it's a combination of both complex mixtures of materials that are in the air in the building put alongside sensitive populations or sensitive individuals. So some people can be in a space uh, that, uh, that really makes them feel and be quite ill, whereas a coworker or another person in the same environment might not feel sick at all. And this has been very challenging uh, uh, for uh, scientists and clinicians to work out. One of the interesting uh, observations has been that when these, when these VOCs off-gas and get out into the living space, Chemical reactions go on and there are novel compounds that are formed that actually don't even have names and certainly haven't been studied in terms of their safety profiles. So in a sense, we're sort of creating a test tube in which new chemicals are formed and which we need to learn more about. And here are some of the indoor sources of VOCs. These will all be familiar uh, to you, but uh, again, many of these are on that list of synthetic building materials that are increasing uh, in their use uh, annually. Well, I just want to take a few minutes, a couple minutes here, to just give some examples of both chemicals in some of these new uh, building products and uh, health effects that may be associated with them. Uh, this is not in any way meant to be an exhaustive list, but it's just to sort of give examples of what the landscape looks like to some extent. Um, here we have uh, different kinds of foam insulation, uh, polystyrene and polyurethane. In the case of polystyrene, uh, the building block is styrene. In the case of polyurethane, one of the parts of the building, one of the building blocks is isocyanates. Uh, styrene is reasonably anticipated to be a carcinogen. So what are worker exposures to styrene as polystyrene is being made? And is that important? And do we care about it? Um, isocyanates are, uh, are an asthmogen, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, uh, asthmogen being a chemical that can actually induce the onset of asthma in a person who did not previously have it, as opposed to an asthma trigger in a person who has asthma, gets exposed to something that triggers an asthma attack. Uh, they're, they're obviously related, but it's important to distinguish between them because we have opportunities to prevent exposures to asthma gens that will keep people who don't have asthma from getting asthma. There's the opportunity for, for primary prevention, and we ought to take advantage of that when, when we can. There are obviously uh, VOCs and paints and coatings but also uh, some metals that have their own uh, toxicity associated with them. For example, cadmium is a developmental toxicant uh, as well as a neurotoxicant. Uh, there are binders, laminates, and particle board. This is one of the areas that is really under rapid development and it's high volume. The various kinds of resins 
formaldehyde resins that are being developed for various applications and various performance characteristics. And they're, they, they sort of fall into several categories of phenol, formaldehyde resins, urea resins, and melamine resins. Formaldehyde is common to all of them. Formaldehyde is a carcinogen, uh, as well as a neurotoxicant and a skin irritant, and it too is an asthmogen. Um, and, and, and the literature in, in, in the, uh, building, the building literature addressing resins is really rich and, and evolving because a lot of things are being put together in these complex mixtures to impart certain characteristics to these resins. Uh, sealants and adhesives involve not only resins but curing agents and various solvents. And many of them are carcinogens, endocrine disrupting chemicals, that is they can interfere with hormone function in the body, re reproductive and developmental toxicants, as well as being asthmogens also. And then uh, in carpets, windows, doors, and wall coverings, there are plasticizers, including the phthalate family, and various uh, kinds of flame retardants, depending on the application. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about flame retardants in a minute. But uh, the th some, but not all of the phthalates are recognized developmental toxicants. What I mean by a developmental toxicant is a chemical that when exposure occurs during in utero, in utero development or infancy, it can actually change, alter the, direct, the trajectory of development. So for example, birth defects is an example of, of a developmental uh, to a toxic effect, uh, but also altered brain development, altered hormone levels. These are developmental effects as well. Uh, of course, lead, uh, a toxic uh, chemical uh, metal that can be found in some uh, building materials, which is both a reprodu reproductive and a neurotoxicant. And then uh, various flame retardants in textiles and furnishings. And uh, they, depending on the particular flame retardant involved, can have endocrine disrupting properties as well as being neurodevelopmental toxicants. So that's just a sort of a smattering to give you an idea of what the, the range of materials, the range of chemicals, and the range of health effects that may be associated with exposure to them. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about this whole uh, issue of, of asthma. And uh, Tom Lentz here from the Healthy Building Network, and he, he and his group recently released a really wonderful report on asthmogens and building materials, which I commend to any of you who haven't seen it. Um, it's, it's, it's an area that's been of great interest to me for a long time because there are, there are clinicians who are in practice and have been for a long time who are not aware that such a thing that, as occupational asthma even exists. They see people in their offices, uh, children or adults, who have asthma. Management of asthma has gotten fairly good and refined and so on. Uh, most people who think a little bit about what the origins of asthma are, think about uh, cat dander or air pollution and so on. But there are very few people that, well, I shouldn't say few. There are a lot of people in medicine who are not aware of the fact that there are chemical exposures that can occur not only in the workplace, but in uh, other environments that can actually induce the onset of asthma in people who did not previously have it. And the reason I think this is so important is if the first asthma attack that has been induced by a chemical exposure is recognized for what it is, Removing that exposure from that person, getting that person away from that chemical, is a way to eliminate the disease from developing, catching hold, and be becoming a chronic problem. If it's not recognized and the person goes back and being re-exposed, it can then become an established chronic disease. So there's a real opportunity here to make a difference. Um, and it's interesting to note that the uh, contribution of, uh, of chemicals uh, uh, to the onset of asthma, so-called occupational asthma, that the, the range is quite large, 10 to 25 percent of cases of new onset asthma. In other words, many people realize that we're not picking it all up. And if we, were, if we did a better job of it, I think that number would be closer to the 25 percent than the 10 percent. Now there are two kinds, or, well, some, really three kinds of occupational asthma. Sensitizer-induced, irritant-induced, and then mixed uh, type. Uh, Sensitizer-induced asthma 
is the kind of uh, thing that might happen after a, a worker, for example, uh, in a laboratory, a university laboratory doing studies of, of rodents, let's say, exposed on a chronic basis to animal dander, uh, would uh, acquire an allergy to that dander, a protein that then uh, causes an antibody response uh, and uh, a subsequent onset of asthma. But there are low molecular weight compounds that can have the same effect, and that includes the isocyanates, which I previously mentioned as being one of the components of polyurethane foam. Now, there, the isocyanates is a family of chemicals, and some are more potent sensitizers than, than others, and some are more volatile than others, so exposed, the likelihood of exposure to uh, some is greater than to others. But nonetheless, these small molecular weight compounds can sensitize the respiratory tract, causing an antibody response, which then creates basically an allergy to isocyanates, resulting in, in asthma. Uh, but not everybody who has asthma as a result of exposure to isocyanates has developed antibodies to it. Some people uh, will develop asthma from isocyanate exposure but not have antibodies. So it's an irritant for them in those cases. And that's why we have this mixed category where sometimes there's an antibody component to the asthma and sometimes there isn't. Um, this really is a significant problem in many industries. but Clinicians and public health officials are increasingly wondering the extent to which those same chemicals might be contributing to asthma risk in people who are not working in those occupations, but who are exposed in their homes or in, in, their, uh, in, in an office building, for example, uh, where you have to think about whether or not that chemical might be involved in order to actually make the diagnosis. Uh, I took this from Tom and his colleagues' uh, uh, book, uh, just a list of, of some of the chemicals that are uh, known to be occupational asthmogens. And if you're interested in the, uh, uh, the references that document their standing as occupational asthmogens, you can find that in, in that book. But basically, they come from authoritative lists uh, that have uh, standing in the medical community in terms of identifying chemicals that are asthmogens. And they include a number of things here that you will recognize, or some of you will recognize, that are, are, are being used in building like epoxy resins and paints, polymers, uh, adhesives. Uh, you, you see the list here uh, of chemicals that are known to be associated with causing the onset of asthma in certain people. Now let me move to the flame retardants. Uh, halogenated flame retardants have been around for a long time, and halogenated flame retardants are those that either have bromine on their molecular uh, skeleton or chlorine, and various uh, numbers of chlorines or bromines are on them. And I just listed here sort of the alphabet soup of, the, of, of, of flame retardants, the polybrominated diphenyl ethers. This is a tetrabrominated bisphenol A. Uh, chlorinated tris and so on. Uh, you'll get an idea. This really, uh, if you begin to look at the molecular structure of these, you'll see some similarities and then the chemists tinker with the molecule and put varying numbers of bromine and chlorine atoms scattered around the periphery of it uh, to impart the flame retardancy that they are being used for. Then there are some uh, flame retardants that are not halogenated but are phosphorus based and nitrogen based and there are some uh, inorganic uh, metal oxides that are also being used. Now, I think this, this story is, is instructive and may begin to help point us toward a way of thinking to find this center of gravity that I think we're looking for. And that's, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, 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 some of these uh, uh, flame retardants to sort of see what the narrative looks like and what are the lessons learned. So polybrominated diphenyl ethers, a family of chemicals, uh, have been used for many, many years. Uh, there are octa, uh, BDE, that means it has eight bromines on the, uh, on the molecule. There's penta, BDE, means it has five bromines. There's deca, BDE, which means it has ten bromines. Um, we now know that in humans, exposure to some of these 
polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which, by the way, are fat-soluble, and some of them are bioaccumulative, meaning that they don't, they, once they get out into the environment, they don't break down easily, and many of them find their way into the food chain, and we're being exposed through our diet. Uh, they're, they're general environmental contaminants. That in humans, higher levels are associated with neurodevelopmental toxicity, thyroid disruption, abnormal reproductive tract development, and increased time to pregnancy. These are human data. But what is troubling about this story is, is the following. PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, a biphenyl ring with varying numbers of uh, chlorine atoms, in this case, scattered around the periphery, were widely used in a, var a variety of industrial processes for many decades, until the 1970s when uh, they were finally banned. In fact, I think they were banned when the original Toxic Substances Control Act was passed back in 1976 because of concerns that they were carcinogenic. That was the main health concern that uh, drove them to that endpoint. Uh, and they were phased out of production, but because many were still in use in a variety of applications like electrical transformers, as well as other applications, they persisted in, uh, there, there, there was a reservoir that kept getting out into the general environment. And not only that, but they're bioaccumulative and persistent, so they didn't go away. And the upshot is that most of us in this room still have we have traces of PCBs in our blood as we sit here, circulating around, although happily those levels have begun to drop uh, over the years since they're getting, out of, uh, getting out, of the, out of production, well, they're out of production and finally levels are dropping in most places. Now, in the 1980s, developmental toxicity was added on to the concerns about cancer from these chemicals based on the early studies that were done by uh, some uh, Jacobson and his colleagues in, in, uh, in Michigan, uh, looking at levels of PCBs in Great Lakes fish and then looking at levels of PCBs in people who were eating those fish and then studying the effect of those uh, uh, exposures on the development of the baby's brains. Followed the cohorts not only through infancy and childhood but into the teenage year years and showed a persistent uh, adverse effect on brain function with uh, higher levels of exposure in utero to PCBs. Uh, and uh, this, these findings have been confirmed in multiple longitudinal studies that have been done, done around the world. So this is all information that we uh, started to get in the 1980s around the brain effects that has just been confirmed and these cohorts have grown up and continue to show effects. All right, here are the PBDEs over here. The only difference is that it's an ether uh, where you have an oxygen separating these two uh, benzene rings, and uh, you have bromine instead of chlorine uh, on the periphery. But that's the difference. Look at, the, look at them, uh, you clearly see similarities. And, and scientists and public health advocates were saying from the outset, these look like PCBs, they're likely to act like PCBs and we should be worried about these. And the levels of these were going up in human breast milk all over the world. It turns out California women had the highest levels in the world. The Swedes recognized the levels going up in the breast milk in Swedish women, and without worrying, without having to know whether or not the children were being impacted, they phased out some of the high volume P PBDEs based on the fact that they were, they were in breast milk and the levels were rising. So the Swedes did that a, a long ago. All right, so now we go along into the 2000s. And I don't want to get down too far in the weeds here, but I just want to point this out. So 2000, 2010, Julie Herbstman and her colleagues at Columbia put together a cohort, had uh, published the results of a cohort of children they had been studying for several years where they had measured in utero exposure to, to the PBDEs, the polybrominated diphenyl ether flame retardants that everybody had been saying look like PCBs and probably gonna act like PCBs, started studying these children and did progress, uh, uh, consecutive neurological testing on these kids as they grew up. So this is, 
testing of these kids when they were one year old, two years old, three years old, four years old, and out here at six years old. In every single case, every single test of neurological function that they uh, uh, performed on these children, the kids who had the highest levels of PBDEs in utero exposures performed more, less well on every test of neurological function. This is the baseline of the low exposure group, and then all of the bars below here are children who did less well than the baseline on every test of neurological function throughout all of those years. So here's a whole cohort of six-year-old, now six and older children, whose brains were impacted by exposure to chemicals that many people had said we should be getting out of commerce long ago. They look like PCBs, they're going to act like PCBs, but because the, the standard was that you had to demonstrate harm before you could act. These kids were exposed. This study has been repeated here in California and other cohort and other cohort elsewhere. So we basically have now a, a, a bunch of kids who have been exposed to these for a longer period than they probably ought to have been because we didn't act on what we knew. We weren't able to act on what we knew. That, I think, is a lesson that we want to take from this as we think about moving toward this center of gravity that we're looking for. Okay, let me move along here. So what happens? Uh, replacement uh, halogenated flame retardants. Well, it's the same old story. Well, okay, well you finally convinced us we're going to get rid of PBDEs and so some of the worst of those are now being phased out by industry, but they're replacing them with alternative halogenated flame retardants uh, for which we have much less toxicity information. What we do know from some animal studies is some of the replacements are also neurotoxicants. Um, in fact, chlorinated tris and related compounds are probably carcinogenic. Um, and so the question is, are we just take, you know, stepping out of the frying pan into the fire based on the fact that we don't have standards or regulations that require some sort of a safety evaluation? We move from one bad molecule to another, and uh, we play the sort of whack-a-mole game for another decade or two. So there's, some, there's another lesson in there that I think that, that we need to be learning. And this is an area where there's been a lot of activism around this kind of thing, trying to influence not only flame retardants, but also chemical policy related to that. And these newer flame retardants, by the way, are now showing up at higher and higher levels in household dust. So we know the exposures are actually happening, and they're increasing. It's a repeating story. If we look at the polyurethane foams, it's a two-part system uh, with varying amounts of amines, glycols, and phosphate, and then the isocyanates are added to them, and collectively this then sets up a curing reaction leading to the foam with the various uh, performance characteristics that uh, people are looking for. Uh, it turns out that the curing time is variable, and it can vary from hours to days, and there are, st there are reports now in the literature of, of families who had polyurethane foam sp sprayed into their homes, were told that they needed to stay out a day or two and then they could safely come back, came back uh, at the appointed time, got sick, uh, including with respiratory symptoms, and it turns out that, that the foam hadn't cured. Sometimes it takes much longer than that for it to cure, so families came back and were exposed to the sensitizing agents when they came back into their homes. There are people now working on uh, isocyanate-free polyurethane foam. That's, that's one of the themes that sort of emerges, uh, recognizing that these isos isocyanates are really uh, trouble. Polyvinyl chloride is a plastic that will be familiar to most of you. Uh, it's one that has a lot of the dimensions of life cycle concerns, and I think it continues to be an instructive plastic for that reason. Uh, it's a polymer of vinyl chloride, which itself is a carcinogen, and then depending on the application, there are various additives that are put into the polymer mix, including stabilizers, which involve various kinds of metals often, antioxidants, pigments, and various plasticizers, including phthalates, but others are used as well. Then there are flame retardants added, so you can see it's one of these mixtures uh, that is very complicated to understand and study, but it's put together in ways that impart certain performance characteristics, and it's used widely in a variety of building applications. Uh, so if we begin uh, at the beginning with, uh, with 
uh, the manufacturer. We have uh, chlorine added to ethylene to give ethylene dichloride, which is reasonably anticipated to be uh, a carcinogen according to the EPA. Uh, and you begin to worry here about worker exposures. Then the uh, uh, ethylene dichloride is uh, transformed into vinyl chloride, which is definitely a carcinogen. Uh, then the vinyl chloride is polymerized into polyvinyl chloride. Um, if you look at the waste stream coming out of these plants, it's got a number of very uh, toxic and uh, often novel organochlorine compounds. Dioxins and furans have been typically those that most people have focused on, but there are other organochlorines uh, compounds in the waste stream as well. And workers are being exposed to not only the, some of the uh, components of the PVC, but also the additives, including phthalates. Um, uh, so if we look at exposure to plasticizers, metal stabilizers, and other additives, it's not only workers, but actually we're now seeing data being published uh, in, the science, in the medical literature showing an association between uh, PVC wall coverings and fluorines that are in homes and the likelihood of a child in that home having asthma. Now these clearly are associations and uh, the advocates uh, and supporters of PVC will always point that out, that this is an association that does not prove causation. That is a, a fact, a reality of epidemiologic work. Uh, but when you begin to see uh, study after study after study showing the same relationship, uh, you begin to, uh, begin to wonder if this is not a causal relationship. Some of the animal studies are also showing impacts on lung development as a result of exposure to phthalates. So a coherent story is beginning to develop here as well. The question is, when do we know enough to act in terms of making other choices for materials in our homes? At the end of life, PVC presents some problems in terms of disposal. It's difficult to recycle. It has to be recycled by itself. It can't be allowed to contaminate other plastic waste streams. Um, uh, if it's burned either purposefully or accidentally in a building fire, a number of toxic compounds are released, including hydrochloric acid, gases, and dioxins and furans, other organic chlorine substances. And then there, of course, is the whole issue of accidents. Um, just last fall, I think, uh, last year, there was a derailment of a, of, a car, of, a, of a train that was carrying vinyl chloride, went off the, the rails in New Jersey, released vinyl chloride gas into the, into the community. So uh, thinking about community exposures uh, at various times in the uh, life cycle as well. One of the common uh, uh, resins that's used in uh, building is BADGE, B-A-D-G-E, it's uh, bisphenol A diglycidyl ether. It is uh, uh, made by combining bisphenol A with the solvent epichlorohydrin. Uh, they're put together in various proportions depending on the intended use. Um, and uh, other additives then can be put into the resin uh, depending on the application, as I mentioned earlier in, in the, that earlier slide. And there are a variety of, of uses of this resin. It's, it's got widespread uses. Uh, bisphenol A is an endocrine disrupting compound. It has estrogen mimicking effects. But I want to point out that it's not just its estrogen mimicking effects that are of concern. Uh, it's true that it's weakly estrogenic if you uh, examine just its capacity to interact with the estrogen receptor. But there are some non-traditional receptors that uh, are also uh, uh, interact that bisphenol A also interacts with in ways that are even more potent than estrogen. Uh, and the animal data are really robust and growing, showing a, a variety of adverse impacts uh, as, as a result of early life exposures to bisphenol A. One of them that concerns me the most is the fact that in utero exposures in animal tests to, to bisphenol A exposures actually modifies the development of the mammary gland, uh, the breast in laboratory animals, and the prostate gland in the males, altering the architecture of the tissue so that in the adult, the gland looks different than it does in the animals that were not exposed to bisphenol A. And those differences in the tissue architecture make it more likely to develop cancer in adulthood.
Now, bisphenol A is a chemical that over 95% of us are exposed to regularly. Uh, that's based on biomonitoring studies by the Centers for Disease Control. This is not a picture that we should be very complacent about. If 95% of people are being exposed to a chemical, including in utero, that alters the trajectory of breast development and prostate development so that it's more likely to become cancerous years, decades later, we should be looking for alternatives. We should not wait until that link is established. It will never be established in humans. We will never be able to measure in utero exposure to bisphenol A, follow a cohort of men or women for 50 years, and link breast cancer or prostate cancer risk back to that in utero development. There's too much noise in that. There's too much water under the dam over those 50 years. It isn't going to happen. So again, when do we know enough to act? Uh, um, in the workplace, workers exposed to this resin actually have higher levels of bisphenol A, so it looks like what's going on is they're actually metabolizing the resin back to the component, including uh, free bisphenol A. And again, I mentioned that indoor air, uh, dust is, is contaminated with bisphenol A and its analogs. Now, we don't know how much of that might be coming from building materials because there are other sources of bisphenol A as well. So that complicates the research agenda. It makes it more difficult for us to figure out how big a problem is this really to building occupants in a building where badge was used as, as a resin and then cured, became hard, uh, is that a, uh, an important source of exposure or not? I don't think we know. So let me just sort of finish up here by, with some, some thoughts about uh, next, uh, where we are and I think next steps. Can we rely on government standards? Well, uh, first of all, regulations and standards only cover a small portion of chemicals and products. So that's where we're beginning. And, and, and many of those standards that do exist are out of date. And what I mean by that is that they're not only, it's not only that they're old, but they haven't even addressed some of the new science. So you won't find a standard for bisphenol A in a, in a building material have, saying much about some of these new receptor studies that I just described. Most standards are risk-based rather than hazard-based, and they rely on exposure controls rather than hazard prevention. And I, I hope that's something that we'll be able to discuss a little bit today and, and, and figure out some nuanced conversation around that, because uh, it, it's really an area of, of, of considerable controversy. Uh, government enforcement of standards is, is limited, uh, and it, as, we're, as we're aware, increasingly we're seeing market-based campaigns that are trying to make changes in building materials based on market forces as opposed to government regulation. The, the whole idea of risk versus hazard-based approaches, I think, is really important. There's a long-standing inherent tension there. Uh, historically, people who have been manufacturing building materials have been primarily looking at function and performance and cost. And then when health concerns do arise, they're usually addressed by saying, well, how can we ratchet down the exposure level uh, as opposed to how do we replace the hazardous chemical? I mean, that's historically uh, been the approach. And even in the whole realm of alternatives assessment, this is really contested territory as well, because some people will have a hazard-based approach to alternatives assessment, whereas Industry trade groups, for example, insist on a risk-based approach, that you have to do the risk assessment for each alternative that you're looking at and not simply look at it from a hazard perspective. I uh, am often drawn back to remind myself and tell others about the whole notion of a hierarchy of hazard controls, which is a basic principle of occupational safety and health. It has long standing in the field of occupational safety and health. And what it has to do with is looking at what is the most effective way to protect workers in the workplace. And the most effective way is to eliminate the hazard. That's the most effective way. You can substitute it. You can try to do engineering around it. Put a spray hood up, for example, so that you're reducing exposures. Uh, you can do administrative activities, uh, and putting regulations and rules and regulations and so on in place. And you can finally, you can provide a worker with personal protective uh, equipment. 
But if you want to do the most effective and efficient uh, intervention, you get rid of the hazard. Uh, that is a basic principle of occupational safety and health. So a hazard-based alternatives assessment would be a process for both identifying and comparing the chemical and non-chemical alternatives based on their hazard profiles and then look what might be, you could replace them with either with another chemical or a technology based on, uh, on the basis of the hazard's performance and economic viability. That would be a hazard-based alternatives assessment. And you would also want to be very careful to avoid regrettable substitution. Not moving from something that is a known hazard to something that you don't know anything about and then 10 years later after you've put together a whole supply chain you say, whoops, that wasn't such a good idea. So we have to have ways of doing this evaluation that are, that are sensible. Uh, uh, transparency is going to be a big part of, uh, of this. We're, we're going to need to identify chemicals and products. Uh, it's not easy to do. Uh, first of all, chemical information does not flow easily in supply chains. There are many people who are making a product who have no idea what the components are made out of that they're using to make that product. We see this time and time again. Um, and often businesses are reluctant to disclose what's in a product because they're concerned about liability or for, com or for, or for competitive uh, business reasons. Um, and chem chemical information is, is often difficult to interpret and it's often incomplete. So if you look at a, uh, a material safety data sheet, for example, it might tell you something about one or two things, but it may be completely silent about something else. Uh, so it's often incomplete as well as difficult to interpret. So we do need new chemical information disclosure systems that will help us identify chemicals and products and materials and then track the use of them through the entire life cycle. Um, safer materials uh, are already on the market. I mean, the whole move around VOCs has resulted, for example, in low VOC paints. We now have PVC carpeting available because some consumers have insisted on it and so manufacturers figured out ways to make it. We have formaldehyde-free uh, fiberboard and so on. Uh, and architects and designers have a real role to play here in terms of uh, putting out uh, specifications that are informed and targeted that will insist on what they want in their buildings. Uh, and then uh, uh, it, if that happens, suppliers can and will respond. We've seen it with real examples here and there's no reason that can't continue. Selecting safer materials will really require an increased focus on transparency and disclosure as well as attentions to hazards and alternatives. I think this package fits together. It's transparency and disclosure as well as gathering more hazard information. So finally, an upstream precautionary approach uh, will, when possible, eliminate hazards uh, in uh, chemicals and products, materials, uh, and so on preferentially purchasing safer uh, alternatives, Co consider the entire life cycle, uh, and untested chemicals and materials should not be presumed to be safe. I think that's a really an important take home message. We shouldn't just be moving to an untested chemical and then wait 10 years or 20 years to begin to w w find out more about its hazardous properties. We need to act on early warnings. That's what the PCB story tells me. Those PBDEs, I mean, that is really a, a a sad story that, that we couldn't act on what we knew based on the PCBs. So learn from old lessons. Um, and finally, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Ken Geiser for uh, contributing some of the content and data that were in a few of these slides. Thank you very much.